The following episode of Dad vs. Daughter was made possible by a contribution from Board and Dice. Hello and welcome to another episode of Dad vs. Daughter. I'm Tim the Dad, and today I'm going to be taking a look at Zapotec. Now, this is a game from Board and Dice. We are going to be building temples and villages and cornfields. We're going to be building pyramids. We're going to be performing rituals and actually offering sacrifices. But don't worry, nobody's going to get killed. So let's just get this to the table. I'm going to show you how to set it up. I'm going to talk through the gameplay, and then I'm going to tell you what I think. So check it out. Before I get into setup, I want to talk about the different areas of the board. Now, we have three separate and distinct regions. We have up here, we have Etla. Down here, we have Aklan, which I'm sure I'm probably mispronouncing these. And then we have Mitla. So you'll notice that we have kind of a blue statue here, a gold and a green. Within each of the three different regions, we have three distinct terrain types. We have the red, which is the plains. We have the hills, which are gray, and then we have the forests, which are green. This area of the board is what they consider capital actions. Now, this is where we are going to be building our pyramids. This tells us the cost of the pyramid and then end of game scoring for that. The cost to, do, uh, to place a disc on a ritual card. This is our trade tiles, and I'll talk about how you uh, get those and what those do. And then we have our sacrifice track over here. And I'll be going into more detail on those when I talk about the actual turn. In setup, we're going to shuffle all of these different tiles and we are going to place those on the individual spots on the board. Now, I have this set up for a two-player game. So you'll notice that the areas that are marked three plus and four are not going to be covered. But you're going to just shuffle these up and then you're going to randomly place these out on the matching spots. So you see we have villages go on the village spots, we have temples go on the temple spots, and we have cornfields that go on the cornfield spots. Now when you're doing this part of setup, remember to remove any of the building tiles that show three plus and four and just return those to the box. For setup of the trade tiles, you'll notice that they have one, two, or three on the backs of those cards. You're going to shuffle each one of those separate stacks, and then you're going to be placing those out in a three by three grid with the level ones on top, then the level twos, and then the level threes. These are our end of game scoring tiles, and you can see that there are nine of those. Each one of those represents the different regions or areas or buildings that we can uh, build throughout the game. So what we're going to do is we are going to shuffle these up, and you'll see they all have this uh, backing on that. And then we are going to be placing them on our track over here. Now, in a two-player game, we are only going to be placing three of those. After we place the three end-of-game scoring tiles in their spots on the board, the rest of these that were not used will go back to the box. There are six resources used in the game. There are three basic and three advanced. The three basic are wood, stone, and brick. And the advanced are corn, gold, and priests. Now, the basic resources are all square and the advanced resources are all circular. Player count is important when it comes to setting up our action deck. In a two-player game, we are going to shuffle this deck up, and then we are going to flip over three cards, and we're going to put those on the table. Now, these are going to represent the places that we can build and the resources that we will be given at the start of each turn. The game is only played over five rounds, so we are going to take four cards, and this is going to basically be the timer for the game. We're going to take those four cards, and we're going to place those next to the cards that we have on the table. Now, in a two-player game, each player is going to be dealt six of these cards. Now, with other players, you're going to have less cards. We're going to take one of those cards, and we're going to flip it over, and we're going to put it here on the scoring part of the board. And I'll talk about how that scoring comes into play on our turns. All the rest of the unused action cards are returned to the box. 
We have a stack of ritual cards. However, we're only going to be using three in any game, regardless of player count. So you're going to shuffle these up, and then you are going to deal three of these to the board. And these will be face up. And these are going to be end of game scoring based on things that you're able to accomplish during the game. Like this one says, you're going to get six VP for sets of three buildings with the same type and different region. Here, you're going to get six VP for sets of three buildings with the same uh, terrain in different regions. And then here, you're going to get six VP for sets of three buildings with the same type and different terrain. Now, there are all different kinds of these. Uh, and you can see here, uh, one VP for each of basic resources and two VP for each of the advanced resources. Because normally, your uh, resources don't count for anything at the end of the game. Uh, you can see... Here's a few other ones that are like the ones I talked about already. Here you get three VP for each pyramid level built. Uh, one VP for each step on the sacrifice track. One, two, or three VP for each trade tile of level one, two, and three. And then another one like I had showed before, six VP for sets of three. All the remaining ritual cards will return to the box. Each player is going to get their own player board and their player colors. Now, there is orange, there is blue, there is also like this purplish color, and there is black. Sadly, no green, but that's okay. Each player is going to get uh, six pieces of pyramid. They're going to get one large, two medium, and three small. They're going to get nine of their normal buildings. They are going to get three discs in order to be able to place those on the ritual cards. They're going to have another disc for scoring and then their last disc for the sacrifice track. Each player will also get a player aid card. Now this is pretty nice because it tells you that all players are going to be doing the play action cards simultaneously, but then in turn order, each player is going to be able to go through these steps. Now on the back, it shows end of the game scoring for the different areas, the sacrifice track, the rituals, and the pyramids. Each player is also going to start the game with one of the basic resources, brick, stone, and wood, as well as their action cards. Also on their board, they're going to have a palace tile. Now, the palace tile is a little special, and I'll talk about that later. Also on the top of the player board, you'll see the cost it, it takes to build each of the buildings. So to build a cornfield, it costs a wood and a stone. To build a village, it costs a wood and a brick. To build a temple, it costs a stone and a brick. And to build a palace, it costs one of each of the basic resources. One wood, one stone, and one brick. This area here on our board is our income. And as we are placing our buildings out on the board and taking those tiles, we're going to be placing those on our board. And those are going to be firing off as part of our turn. And I'll talk about that in the gameplay. Now that we have our board and player boards all set up, we're ready to play. At the start of every round, each player is going to select one of their action cards from their hand, and they're going to place it face down on the table. Now, uh, once everyone has their action cards on the table, then everybody flips them up, and then we are going to resolve them. So let's take a closer look at what those action cards do and how we uh, use those to build and how we resolve turn order. The action cards are basically broken out into three distinct areas. We have the top is going to show us which of the resource rows or columns we're going to be firing off for our income. The middle part is going to be showing where we can build. Now, that could be a region, it could be a terrain type, or it could be a building type. So there's nine different things that those could be. Finally, at the bottom, we have a number. Now, this is going to be used to determine play order. The lowest number is going to go first, so it's not always uh, whoever goes and then you go clockwise. It's going to be going in numerical order from lowest to highest. There are numbers from 1 to 37, and you can see I've got a handful of different types. So that's going to come into play when uh, I want to possibly go first uh, in order to uh, maybe... Uh, do something before another player, or I may not have much of an option and I am going to be uh, placing where I can actually build buildings, either in the region or the type. 
or the terrain type. For the individual turns, you'll notice the first thing that we do is collect income. So based on that card that was selected, and let's just say that I had selected this card, I'm going to be choosing either the row or the column that has stone at the top. So if I look at a player board here, you can see that I'm either going to be uh, collecting income off of this column or this row. Now, the very first turn, you're not going to have any buildings on there that you're going to get additional income from. So the only thing you will get is that basic resource. So in this case, I would get a stone. The next thing I would be able to do would be to perform capital actions. However, you do not have any of the advanced resources that you need in order to perform those capital actions on the first turn. So the first turn, you're going to skip that. And then from the second turn on out, you may have the resources you need in order to perform those capital actions. But let's go ahead and take a closer look at what those are. So the first thing we could do is we could buy trade tiles and those cost either one, two or three gold, depending on which level they are at the top. So you'll see the top, we have level ones and the middle level twos and then the bottom level threes. Now the top levels, the level ones, these will grant you immediate resources. So you can see you have the one X there at the top and this is going to immediately give me one stone and one wood. And then I'm going to get those resources and then I'm going to flip this over and I'm going to put it, put it next to my player board. Now I'm not going to replace that on the trade area until I am done with my turn because I want to be able to remember that I have already taken a level one because you can only buy a uh, single item from each of the three levels. So at most I would be buying three of the trade tiles, a level one, a level two, and a level three. Now the level twos are once per turn. So you'll see that one with a circle. So what you're gonna do is on your turn, if you are able to perform this, in this case, I can give up one stone and I can get one priest. I would flip that over and I would keep that very near to my player board because at the end of the round, I'm gonna reflip that back over so that I can do that on my next turn. And then finally, the level threes are kind of a mixed bag. Uh, here, I can do this once per turn. I can trade one wood in and I could put a building out on any forest space that was available. Here, it's a one-time use where I can place one of my discs on one of the ritual cards without paying any cost. And then on this one, I could only or I could build a cornfield and it would only cost me one stone instead of normally also requiring a wood. Now there's a bunch of different ones of these, but these were the ones that were already on the board during setup. Another capital action we may be able to uh, perform is building a pyramid level. You know, you'll see that it costs one of each of the basic resources plus a priest. And it tells us that also on that little spot on the board itself. Uh, and that is for each level of the pyramid that we're going to be building. So when we build a level, we are always going to start with the biggest piece that we have. Now, in a two-player game, only these two spots are going to be available. So let's say that the orange player builds his first piece, and he is also the first player to build a temple or a uh, pyramid piece. He's going to place that there. Then he's going to choose one of the end-of-game scoring tiles, and let's just say he decides to take the forest, and he's going to place that right there. Now, at the end of the game, he's going to count how many of his buildings that he has on that different terrain type, and then he is going to multiply that by uh, the number of pyramid pieces that he has there. Now, you can only build one level of a pyramid on your turn. Uh, I can't build a level two. However, if I did have the resources, I could build a second pyramid over there with my medium piece. Now, it is possible to build with a medium piece. The pyramid is going to be completed when a uh, the smallest piece has been added. So you can see in this first instance, this could be a level three pyramid because it has the medium level and the small level that can still be built. However, on this one, you can only place one small part of the pyramid on there and then it will be completed. That's part of the strategy of the game is uh, possibly getting your pyramid pieces out for that end of game bonus so that the other players don't get that. Let's say on a future turn, the blue player decided to place one of their pyramid pieces there. Now that pyramid is considered complete. And at the end of the game, each player is going to get five points for each of the pieces on a completed pyramid. 
So in this case, orange and blue would each get five points. Now let's say that uh, the big pyramid looked like this, where the orange player built the base, but the blue player throughout the game built the next two levels. That's a completed pyramid. The orange player is only gonna get five points, but the blue player would end up getting 10 points for that pyramid. Another one of the capital actions we may be able to perform is to perform a ritual. Now, normally it costs a priest and a gold, and then you're gonna look at how many discs are already on that ritual card. If there are none, then you only pay the priest. However, if another player has a disc on there, then you also have to pay gold times the number of discs. So in a two player game, I would have to pay one gold if the blue player was already there and the orange player wanted to add their disc to that ritual card. It's important to note that you may only have one of your discs on a ritual card. So that's why you get three. You only can put one on each of the cards. The last capital action we may be able to perform is a sacrifice. Now, in order to perform that, you need a priest and one to five corn. Now, the amount of corn that you pay in order to take this action is going to determine how many spaces that you're going to go up on that sacrifice track. So if I only give up one corn, I'm only going to move one space. If I give up three corn, I'm going to move three spaces. And if I can give up a maximum of five corn, then I can move five spaces. But let's take a little closer look at that track. There are 12 spaces on the sacrifice track. And as you move your disc up the track, you are going to be either collecting uh, the resources, the victory points, or in this case, you would be able to get a discount. Now, this gives one victory point. This gives either one brick, one wood, or one stone. This space here gives you a permanent discount on buying level two trade cards. So uh, a trade card would only cost you one. Now, it's also good to note that level ones always cost you one. You can never actually uh, get a trade card without paying at least one gold. Here you're gonna get two victory points. Here you're gonna get another one of your basic resources. Here you will get a two coin discount on level threes. So if you make it up to this spot, then any of the trade cards will only cost you one gold. You'll get three victory points here, another uh, choose one of the basic resources. On this spot, you can place one of your discs on a ritual card without paying a priest. Here you're gonna get four victory points. Here you can place one of your discs on a ritual card without paying any of its cost. And then here you're gonna get five victory points. Now at the end of the game, you're going to look and whoever is the highest on this track is gonna get nine points. Whoever is comes in second is gonna get six. And in a three or four player game, whoever has uh, the third highest is gonna get three points. Now it's important to note that uh, in order to break ties, the first player that got there is going to basically win the tie. So let's just say that orange had gotten all the way up to here on that track. And if blue got to that point as well, orange would win the tiebreaker and get the nine points and then blue would get the six points. Now we are at step three, which is the construction step. Now this is where we're gonna build our houses and it tells us that we must obey the action card. So if you remember that action card that we had selected on our turn was the cornfield. So that means we're only gonna be able to build cornfields on this turn. We can build them on any of the open spaces that we ha that have tiles on them. Doesn't matter what terrain and it doesn't matter which of the regions, but we can only build those cornfields. Now, in this case, I probably would want to build my cornfields down here in this region. And the reason being is that is our scoring card. So however many houses that I have there, that's going to give me a two times bonus. So let's just say that the orange player built a cornfield here. They're going to take this tile. They're going to put their house on that. Then they're going to take this tile and they're going to put it on their player board on one of the income spaces. Now, they can put it anywhere they want, but once that tile has been placed, it can't be moved or removed. And you'll notice that if you cover this spot, you're gonna get a gold immediately. This will give you a corn immediately, and that will give you a priest. But what you're gonna be wanting to do is essentially build your income so that when you fire off either a row or column, uh, 
on a turn, you're going to be getting the resources that you need on that turn. So let's just say that I know that I've got a lot of cards that have brick on the top. So I'm going to be firing off this brick a lot. So I may want to place that tile right there. On my next turn, when I do that income, if I've selected brick, then I could get one brick plus one stone and one corn. And I'm going to be getting that every turn that I fire off that row or that column. And then, like I said, I'm going to be placing more buildings on there to fill that out to get more income. When I do that income, if I have a row or column completed and I fire that off, I'm going to be getting a total of seven resources because each of the building tiles here have two resources on them. So I would get two, four, six for those if I had tiles there, plus the resource that I used to fire that off. Now, let's say this was the first round and that was the only building that I could build on my turn. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to be getting two victory points for every one of those buildings. So orange would get two victory points in this case. And then the last thing I'm going to do on my turn is I'm going to draw a new action card. Now that action card is going to come from one that is here on the display. So let's say that I know on my turn, uh, I may really want to go first. So I might want to choose this tile or this card because it has a number two on it. That has a 13 and that has a 14. But let's say that I don't necessarily want uh, a temple card or a wood resource card. I might want the hills and I, or I might want the stone. So I might take that. So let's just say uh, I decide to take this. This is going to go into my hand with my other cards. And then the card that I used, I'm just going to kind of put sideways uh, on the table to know that I've already used that. Now, when blue takes their turn, after they've selected their card, let's say they decide to choose this uh, temple card. And let's say that they had used this card, then they would put that on the board. And there's only one card left. So that one remaining card is actually going to go up here and it's going to be the new scoring card for the next turn. Those cards that we used on that turn, those are going to be part of the new uh, action cards that we're going to be able to select from on the next turn. I mentioned those four that we had during setup. We're going to be flipping one of those over because this is the timer with it only being five rounds. So now to start the second round, you'll see that we have these three cards available and we only have three cards left in the uh, deck. Once this deck runs out, that signifies that we have played five rounds, and then we'll do final scoring. Now, I had said that I was going to come back to the palace building. So what you're going to do is, in order to build that, you're going to be paying the cost up here, which is one of each of the basic resources. And then you're going to be placing that on the board. Now, you have to still follow the restrictions of the action card you placed as far as where is that where that's going to go on the board. But let's say that um, I had placed a cornfield, and we're going to use the orange player's building here. So if my restriction was the cornfield, I could build my palace here. I would basically take this uh, from the board, and instead of putting it onto my income track, it gets flipped face down, and it just goes up here, just to show that it doesn't contribute to my income, but I have built my palace, and what I used to, for my palace. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that palace tile, and I'm going to place it on the board, and place my building on there. Now, the special thing about the palace token is that that represents two of that type of building. So another reason why you're going to be placing this on your board and putting that face down like that is that palace now represents two cornfields. So if I have any end of game uh, triggers that go off of cornfields, I'm going to remember that that palace now is providing two of those. Now, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the sacrifice track, uh, whoever is the highest on there is going to get nine points. Second would get six and three for third if you are playing a three or four player game. And then it says you must move at least once. So you have to have moved off of that starting space on the sacrifice track in order to be eligible to get any of those points. We're going to look at the discs that we have on the ritual cards and we're going to get either 12 points or 18 per card based on being able to score on those. And then we're going to look at our pyramids and we're going to get one point per level of the pyramid 
times the number of houses that we have in that end of game scoring. So uh, you remember that that first pyramid, when I, the orange player placed their pyramid piece down, they chose the fourth spot. And let's say for that second that they had chosen that, then they are going to get one point for each house that they have in the forest area and one point for each house that they have in the uh, Etlin region. They'll also get five points per level of pyramid that is completed. And whoever has the most points is going to be the winner. So that's a high level overview on how the game is played. So now let's get to what dad thinks of the game. If you follow us on Facebook, then you already know that I love this game. Uh, it's actually a very easy game to play, but there is a lot of strategy involved in this, uh, especially in a four-player game, because you are going to be looking at that turn order to try to influence certain things, uh, You know, knowing what you think the other players are going to be building based on the resources that they have, and maybe being able to block that, uh, being able to select... Uh, and this is where going last is not a bad thing because you get to determine what will be the bonus card for the next round. And you can kind of set yourself up with that. Getting the trade tiles is uh, very key too because it allows you to possibly get some of the resources you need right at that time in order to build uh, stuff that you may not be able to uh, just because you didn't have those in your income. Or being able to, if you have an engine where you are generating just a ton of one resource, getting one of those trade tiles that could possibly allow you to trade that in, trade one of those in, maybe for uh, like a priest or uh, gold or maybe two of another resource. Also being able to have discounts or being able to do some of the other actions without paying the full cost uh, can be key as well. And I think getting your pyramid out first uh, to be able to choose that end of game scoring condition, uh, I know that it helped me in my games that I've played, but also kind of working together in order to get that pyramid built, uh, completed, so that you can get those points as well. Overall, I really like the gameplay. Like I said, it's, it's very simple, but it's very, you have very meaty decisions, I think. Uh, based on which cards uh, that you're choosing out of your hand for those actions um, and being able to place in certain areas. Uh, I, I like how that kind of changes every round as you get a new uh, action card and new ones come up. Plus, you know, the action card that your uh, opponent just played is now going to be available on the next turn. I think gameplay goes fairly quickly. There's not really a lot of analysis paralysis in this game because you are limited by that action card that you played. So uh, you're only going to be looking at either uh, that type of building that you can build this turn or that type of uh, region or terrain that you can build in. So with those being pretty limited on the board, there should not really be any AP at all. The only AP that would probably come into play is, uh, do I need to spend the resources in order to build something, or uh, do I need the gold in order to get this uh, trade tile? And at five turns, the game actually plays fairly fast, uh, even at four players. Uh, like I said, everybody is choosing that action card simultaneously. Then you're just looking at the number to find out uh, the player order, and you go from there. So uh, real easy. I do like the income aspect of this because, again, that dictates what card you're going to be playing because you want to fire off that specific column or row, uh, but it is really neat. Component-wise, I do like the components quite a bit. Uh, the cards all have a very nice linen finish to them. The art on the cards uh, is language agnostic, uh, but it's very clear what each represents. And I, like I said, I do like the art on how that looks, uh, especially the temples. And then here you can see the, uh, the Etlin there. And, you know, just, you know, they, they're very clear as far as what those are. The numbers are very easy to read. Uh, even if I don't have my glasses, I can still tell what that is. And the same with the resource type. I think the uh, artwork on the board itself is 
really kind of neat. It could have been maybe a little bit more detailed, uh, but if you do look closely, you can see like some villagers in the various spots of there. But the, the board is very serviceable, so don't take that as a negative. I do actually like the way the board looks. I also like the way that the board is laid out too. The three regions are very distinct. Then you have your capital action area that is almost, you know, uh, a fourth of the board and then you've got you know your um, your sacrifice track there and your trade area up at the top the components as far as the houses they're nice wooden pieces like i said i really wish that they would have included green as a player color but you know that's okay uh, but these are nice and big reminds me of the white houses that are in uh, teotihuacan uh, but uh, the pyramid pieces themselves they're plastic and they fit right on uh, top of each other, you know, very nice. And the detail on there, if you look close, you can kind of see like a stone there, um, but it just it looks sharp and they're kind of neat, you know, have that little toy factor almost because, you know, on your turn, you may be fiddling, you know, playing with your pieces. Um, but that's, you know, those are nice. The tray tiles themselves are nice and thick cardboard. Really, my only complaint about the components is the um, the resource chits. I mean, these are, they're thick, um, but, you know, they're just kind of nondescript. I almost probably would have wished that these were uh, wooden blocks. I realize, you know, it's, this is a lot uh, more cost efficient in order to uh, just print these off on cardboard. Uh, and this may be something that I decide to upgrade. Now, if I've got another game where I've got wooden blocks, I may swap those out. Or uh, I've recently, if you've been following on Facebook, have been uh, working with clay in order to upgrade components in my board games. So I may actually make a bunch of these um, resources out of clay. I like the variability of only having three of the ritual cards that you're going to use. And like I showed you, you know, there's a whole stack of those. So each game you're going to have slightly different end of game scoring as well. Um, also, most of the tiles here, while they are very similar, some of them are different. Uh, you'll notice that villages always give you one of the basic resources and a gold. Uh, the temples always give you a priest and one of the basic resources. And then the cornfields give you corn and one of the basic resources. So depending on what you need, uh, that may come into play with your strategy. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you've got very clear areas uh, for three and four player games that you are going to uh, not fill in during a two player game. But um, I like this with more players. There's a lot of different strategies I think that you can employ here. Um, but with that higher player count, I, I like the tension that you have. Um, and I, I really liked, you know, how that last player, even though you're last going uh, in turn, uh, you know, you get to control which one of those cards is going to go up for scoring. So it kind of, you know, balances that out as you're able to kind of set yourself up on a future turn. The game does include a solo mode. And as longtime watchers know that I'm not really much as a solo player, uh, but I am actually ex excited about trying this one out. I like the game that much. Um, so I may be uh, playing it solo and posting, you know, my thoughts on that on our Facebook page. So uh, stay tuned to that. But I give Zapotec two thumbs way up. I really enjoy the heck out of this game. Actually can't even wait to play it again. Uh, if you get the chance, check it out. Um, I, I think you'll really enjoy this. So that is Zapotec from Board and Dice, and we will catch you guys next time. Thanks for watching our video. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, click that like and subscribe button. You can also follow us on social media like Facebook. And Twitter at Dad v. Daughter. And if you like what we do and you want to support us, you can visit our Patreon page. So thanks for watching. Thanks.